So it's a great pleasure uh, to be in conversation with Dayanita. Um, and this is a sort of ongoing conversation that we're very happy to share um, with you. And um, what we're doing today is really unpacking the museum. Looking at the last few years of Dayanita's practice, not just as an artist working with photography, but also transforming how the photograph is viewed, collected, and consumed. We'll start with the Museum of Chance, which is a project very close to Dainita's heart, um, which has just been installed um, at the MoMA in their new displays at the opening of the new building, and which the director, Glenn Lowry, chose as his particular highlight and eloquently described as a metaphor and a microcosm of what we are. So, Dainita, will you tell us a little bit about your relationship with institutions and how your work challenges and inhabits and transforms and really plays with these spaces? Yeah, I have, I have several problems with uh, museums and galleries because I work with the medium of photography. Um, and the fact that I can't rearrange my work at any time is very problematic for me uh, that the photography somehow gets fossilized behind glass on a wall is also very problematic for me. But, you know, when I started, I thought this is the way it is because world over, wherever I went, that's how people showed photographs. You made a print and you put a mat and you put a frame and maybe you put an edition and put it on the wall. And what I didn't like was the passive way in which people engaged with the work, but more than that, that, that great pleasure of photography, of changing the context and changing the meaning continuously was impossible to do in a museum or gallery setting. You know, when you have a box full of prints, a shoebox full of prints, you keep building your own narrative as many times as you like, but exhibitions don't allow for that. And I, of course, thought, uh, sort of, you know, like maybe because I come from India, I don't know better. And if I, when I go to America, people at MoMA will know and people at the Met will know and, you know, the Tate will know. Just the big museums, like someone would have found other ways of working with photography. And gradually I realized that everybody works with photography in the same way as Stieglitz did in 1929. It is 90 years now. So it's, it's, it, it was like, this can't be. But it was. Nobody was, nobody was doing it, present, working with photography in another physical way. And my friends who are sculptors, they put a big piece in the center of the room. People walk around, they bend down, they look at it in different lights, they move back. I wanted them to experience my work in that kind of physical way, with their bodies and not just with their eyes. But it was just not possible. And no museum would let me touch my work. I couldn't go into the Tate and say, can we move these images around? So the only way to do it was for me to make a structure that allowed me to change images at will. Now, the big problem with museums is they'll say, yeah, we can change it, but we have to get the registrar because it has to come out of shipping. You know, when you're in the Venice Biennale, you have to take as many prints as you can put on the wall because there's no storage. So I, all of these things together, I thought, I want my own structure. It's going to have its own storage. And it'll have the possibility for me to change the display in a second. And so I developed this structure with some wonderful carpenters and the idea that it can fold down because shipping is the other thing that uh, museums always tell you, you know, just send us the photos, we'll print them. I would never let someone print, print my photographs. I have, to, I have to make the work myself. The work is not just the image. So I found a way to be able to make these structures that also held within them these boxes, which allow for further storage of the prints and allow me to change it all the time. And this is Museum of Chance, now at MoMA, which is 162 photographs, and I think about 80 can be displayed at one time. 
So there is always the promise of things will change, things will move, depending on when you come. I'll go back in December and make another museum. Museum of Chance actually has within it at least seven museums incubating that I know. But there may be several others that other curators will find. So for me, this was like the mother museum because it could produce endless museums, endless combinations, endless curations. Um, these are the boxes, all of them have three images each. The images are not glazed with the idea that no curator could ever put my prints on the wall. Or if they did, they would be risking damaging the prints because they're not glazed. And that was all, it was all the problems I had with the institutions that made me develop the form and every detail of it. Like everything I disliked about the institutions has been addressed here. I'm sure more things will come up, but I got it. So you can see at the back here, you know, I also feel that museums need tables. These benches make you want to lie down. That's not what I want to do in a museum. I want to have a conversation like this. Mm -hmm. But for a conversation, I prefer a higher table, 30 inches wide. I've tested it as the right kind of dimension for intimacy but a certain yeah. distance. So when I, when I saw you in Dhaka, you were actually sitting within a structure. Yeah. And, and that sort of became your own museum. And that was a sort of early iteration of this play with the book form, which is something that you've been very attached to, and the idea of, of your own museum, which completely thwarted not just the institution, but all of the mechanisms by which we buy and sell and consume art. Yeah, I also have some concerns about value and the market, especially for photography, the notion of editions. Um, and I was always confused by how little value we had for the book and the immense value we had for the print. And I understand this is the system that was set up in 1929, but surely we can find other systems now. And since I don't control the art world, so I couldn't make the shift in the print world, but what I did do, I have a great ally in all of this, and that is Gerhard Steidel, who is the mother of all characters, I think. He's a publisher, art book publisher, that Danita has had a very long relationship with. So I said to him, Gerhard, often I want to cut up my books and make exhibitions out of them. Why don't you make me a book where each, foot, each image in the book is also on the cover? So he said, oh, that's ridiculous. You can't make a book with 88 different covers. The cover is the identity. I said, no, but I want to make exhibitions of the book. You see, the insurance and shipping of art is such a huge expense. Now, I could just have Steidl ship 88 books to Kyoto, and they can put them up on the wall or Dhaka. So, as always, he thinks about it for a day or two, and then he says, okay, we try it. It'll be a nightmare, but we try it. So we actually made a book with 88 different book covers. Mm -hmm. And then that wasn't enough. I thought, why are people giving so much value to my silver gelatine prints, but they won't give value to my beautifully printed offset prints, which in some cases, I actually prefer the offset over the digital print. As long as I made silver, it was a different story. But once I started to make digital prints, I actually prefer offset. So I made this wooden structure with which I could then display the images on the wall. And I saw that structure as my work. Then I started to make accordion folds out of the books, out of, in the structure. Then I made that bag, because you know you might want to carry an exhibition with you on the flight and you know maybe five people can travel and then 10 sets can go no shipping no insurance you have the exhibition and you all fly back so every aspect of this exhibition making becomes a challenge to me and i love it when a curator says you know this is not going to be possible because we can't really <laughs> afford to pay for your furniture to travel from delhi what's wrong with our museum benches as happened with hayward and that's when I made the tables and the stools that fit inside the table, that fits inside the museum. So the museum doesn't even 
The museum that is acquiring my museum doesn't know they're getting all my furniture, but now it's there. So now they're saying, but if we use it, it'll get damaged. So we have further problems, yes. but we'll... Exhibition copies. E exactly, <laughs> exactly. But can we talk a bit more about this notion of um, mobility hmm. and why it's so important to you? And, and I think there is this tension between needing to be at home. Yeah. And yet your work has this sort of immense wealth of experience which has been achieved through travel. And now these entire environments can travel. Um, and so many times your museums, as you said, contain many other museums. And then you can also wear your museums. Right? Aha. <laughs> but I can also travel with them in a suitcase. Yeah. Because on business class, you can carry five suitcases. You're allowed five extra five pieces extra of luggage. Pieces. Actually, I have a quote from you that, uh, that I found earlier today, which was in response to, I think, a question by Chris Dercon on museums of the future. Right. And you wrote, to me, the museum of the future is small and portable. It's organic and allows for change and growth continuously. It is a suitcase museum on wheels. Oh, that one. It has ambassadors who transport it on flights and trains. The suitcases are the display as well as the storage units and must include a reserve collection. They may be affiliated to larger institutions such as state and take facsimiles from their collections or they are standalone like my museum bhavan. One could say they are pop-up museums that may be on show for an evening or an entire year. They have a PDF as a catalog which can be printed on demand. So this is to remind you of <laughs> <laughs> what remains. The ambassadors seek new venues for them in the places they travel to and patrons to make an event for their opening. The museums of the future will need to reach a wider cross-section of people and not depend on those visiting them. So, the suitcase museum. Business class lets you carry five extra bags. So the max number of, museums, of suitcases in my museum would be seven. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yeah. that's brilliant. But I never got invited to any of those conferences about the future of the museum. I think I have something very important to say, but, you know, because I'm not one of the curators or I am museum director of Museum Bhavan, but I don't know why I never got invited. Well, the Museum of the Future is opening in Dubai, so I hope somebody is listening. <laughs> <laughs> but. It's true, I think the museums are too pompous and they think everyone has to come to them. And not everyone has the time or the resources to come to them, but they would still be interested. And so how wonderful if I could carry a little museum back from the Tate and take it to a small place that I may be traveling to, that I could have an exhibition at the Saligaon Club of the Tate, for example you know, to actually say this is my, so I become an ambassador. So since nobody else is concerned about my museums, after I sold Museum of Chance, or after all the museums got acquired, I was very excited, especially when MoMA got Museum of Chance because it was never to be made available in my lifetime to anyone, unless it was a MoMA. And guess what happened? Moma called. So the museum went away, two months of feeling ecstatic, like, wow, I'm, my museum of chance is in the Moma. Something's in the Met, something's in Louisiana. And then there was quite a big depression because museums mean storage. And your work can sit in storage for 20 years even. Like, who knows if in my own lifetime I would have seen. Uh, one of my museums or not. So that's when I went to Gerhard and I said, we have to make a miniature museum so that all my museums are also in, in this box. So he made me that, but I also wanted to deal with the issue of mass produced and unique. So I said to him, we'll make the museums, nine miniature museums, but I would like each box to be unique. So he said, what do you mean? I said, you print the inside books, I'll get 3,000 different boxes made in India. And then let's ask the people, is this mass produced, is it unique? And you give it value 
because it's unique, but you won't give it value because it's mass produced. But now I'm giving you something where it's mass produced and unique. So that is my sort of response to the market. And then after we made the box and people started to acquire the museum, I still felt it was not enough. You know, the suitcase had happened, the case had happened, uh, the bookcase had happened, this box had happened. And I thought, I want more out of these museums. It has to be more accessible. So with my friend Anit, who runs Pero, we designed this jacket that has nine pockets so that I can wear my museums. And I can literally force feed you into my work. So I could charge for it. We were just wondering how, how I would disseminate it. But you know, it could be like, and I can go into, I can go into the museum's toilet, set up my exhibition, and by the time the guards realize <laughs> that I'm having an exhibition, I just wrap it up and I go. And I can walk in like this to a museum. I mean, nobody's going to tell me how they're right? So this is a museum of men. So I thought the museums have two names. So museum of men is called a museum of curiosities. And out of museum of women, this is the only museum that was retired. <laughs> Why is that, Anita? whether it's in my bags or suitcases or my jacket or my, you know, it could, I don't know, I could design all kinds of things to be able to wear my museum. You'll soon be invited to perform the museum regularly. <laughs> Hasn't happened as yet. I have to do my own, my own thing. I've done it on the street in Venice. And that's the suitcase I travel with. What's happened with this museum bhavan box that is so nice is that I need the books back though, because this is the Ishara Foundation. So it's, they're not gifts, unfortunately. <laughs> so a couple bought the Museum Bhavan box and I really see them as collectors of the future. You know, they spend 9,000, no, not 9,000, 7,000 rupees. They buy the Museum Bhavan box. They go to Agra and it's their anniversary. So they put out the Museum of Photography with the Taj Mahal at the back. And so they have their own opening the way they want to. They're the only two people there. And why not? So anybody who has the box can have the opening, whichever the way they want, and they can decide, I'm just gonna show a tiny bit of Museum of Men, but a lot of Museum of Printing, tiny bit of vitrines, and build their own, curate their own museum. Oh, I don't know what happened. And then after I made all the museums and they went into other museums, I made Museum Bhavan. Then I got to, shall I say that now? Yeah, absolutely. Then I got to where I started to think, well, what do I really want? Um, I have to, what do I want to live with? How do I want to live? And this is it. This is my house. This is what I would like. And it's on tour right now, but when it comes back, I would like this to be in my house and be the only thing. It packs into two crates, so it always has to be able to go flat in a plane, because if it has to go standing, it's a lot more expensive and only two flights out from India. So then it opens out. So at the back is my museum. These are my storage cabinets for the prints that can go in here, boxes that can go onto the wall. That's my bed, 
my desk, two stools, and my table to eat. And it's called the Museum of Shedding because that is sort of like my minimum requirement. So this side would be my house, and the other side is the museum with the images and a bench for visitors. So I can keep sleeping, doing whatever I like, and people can come and see on the other side. Well, this brings us quite nicely to your interest in architecture, yes. which has been something that has been sort of a lifelong pursuit, you know, and something that you've really kind of honed in on recently. And there's a particular type of space that you either have gravitated towards or have discovered in your own pictures. And these new montage works are in a way quite magical because you delve into each image, you're looking at light and dark within the image and taking the architectural line in a, in a two-dimensional plane and completely sort of upending our understanding of both photography and space. And as we were talking through this today, I think we, I, I realized that you're making us reevaluate the, st the stability and the reliability of the image at a time where everything is digital in this completely analog format, right? Um, so, you know, even without the use of technology, you're sort of reminding us that images can always lie, especially photography, which we think of as documentary and, you know, the last presentation was very much about photography as documentation, but here it's completely transformed. If I get time from all these museums and jackets and suitcases, I would love to rewrite the history of photography because I think photography is vast and magical and fascinating, but it's got so narrowed and become so, yeah, just so narrow. It's vast. You know, one of the first photographs made, one of the first two photographs made publicly is a, a self-portrait that Hippolyte Bayard made of himself because he did not get the credit for inventing photography. The credit went to Daguerre. And he was so upset that he photographed himself lying on a chair like this and called it Hippolyte Bayard drowned himself after not getting credit from the government. That could have been the starting image from photography, for photography, and we would have known from the start what a live photography can be. It was, of course, the first self-portrait. But just imagine, or maybe someone younger is going to do that, and I don't have time to do it anymore, but it's a whole rewriting of the history of photography. One is with Hippolyte Bayard, so we don't trust images. Anyway, now, with digital, we know we can't trust images. But from the beginning, we couldn't trust images. I don't know when the idea of truth came into photography. You know, it's always been fiction. We, photographers will say, yes, it's fiction because I make the frame right. and all that. But it's much more than that. So now with digital, you might agree with me. But 10 years ago, you would not have agreed with me. Uh, but I know that photography is a lie. And I dwell in that lie, and I love the fiction that photography can constantly create and recreate. So I had been, in the last few years, very interested in photographing architecture in, in Japan, in Italy, in Sri Lanka, of course in India, and making piles and piles of prints as I do to see what is the work building into, what does the work want to be, rather than oh, I'll make prints and put them on the wall, because now I couldn't do that. And as I had these piles lying on tables, I started to notice that there was something in the Italy pile that was corresponding to the Japan pile. And I actually thought, am I losing my mind? Because I could just make a cut in this photograph like this. paste it onto this image, and get this. And you see this in the exhibition, and if you don't slow down and look at the work carefully, you'll think, oh, it's another nice Dianita photograph, or not, whatever you think. But that it's a photograph, it's a place. And when I put it on Instagram, I had architects saying, this is a Where fascinating... Where is this? Exactly. And 
So it doesn't translate in the digital world, but when you look at the print in there, you will see it's cut and paste, old style, done by me. Luckily, my hands are not shaking as yet, so I have a pretty stand, uh, steady, hand. steady hand. So did you follow what I was trying to explain? So I had to just cut my print like that. This You're very lucky print. that Danita is sort of explaining this in yeah, detail to us. Yeah, I don't usually. <laughs> And there's a, a play, I think, also of, of time in these images. Of course. The fact yeah. that you're looking at, at modernist architecture, but also older Japanese forms of architecture. And of course, uh, the Japanese aesthetic had influenced modernity. Um, so there's also these sort of worlds that are meeting in these images. You know, I didn't set out to be a historian of any kind. I mean, if any historian, I'll be a photo historian, perhaps. But I am just amazed at what I'm finding in these correspondences in the architecture. And then the images are sort of making themselves. I'm not doing very much. I have all the prints, but the montages, sorry, are making themselves. So I had already made this montage. It's in the collection of the foundation. It's on display here. And Smith, I warn you, there's a third. It's now a trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> and then this one was made. And since this was my first montage, I'm very attached to it. So I don't usually like having my work in my house, but I have a print of it in my house. And the museum acrylic was too expensive. So I said, forget it, it's for my house. I don't need to put this acry acrylic. Um, and so it was just there. And I was making other montages and cutting out images. And look what happened. I cut out a window for another montage. And I said, I'm losing my mind. What is going on? So they're all the same square prints. Nothing is enlarged. Nothing is cropped. They're just two equal size prints. So the story was finished. In fact, the work had been acquired already. And now this is how it hangs in my house. It's and I don't know what other piece will fall into it. I can't really do it to demand, but somehow these images that I've created are all, I don't know how to explain it other than to say it's magic. And that's another one of them. I think we were going to leave it at that. This no? is the last ah. one, yeah. So with that, I think we'll open it up to the floor for questions. I'll pass right the, the mic front. to you, just a sec. There you go. Thank you. I feel it's a huge honor to listen to your process uh, because it's... Uh, I love talking about yeah, it. Yeah, it's great. I'm, 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 I'm more excited than the audience. I'm, I'm glad we have this moment with you. And I saw these works and I, right, I did see the cut and, it was, and it's great to see how you created a, a third meaning or a new meaning or a new place. Um, but my question is, um, I'd like to know more about the images. You talked about kind of building the museum, but can you maybe share with us the... The, the subjects and what you like to photograph in these museums, because some of them look quite cinematic and quite striking and personal and intimate. And I'd like to hear you talk about it, if you don't mind. I'm, I'm very privileged uh, because I'm able to photograph whatever I am drawn to. Um, and it's taken a long time to get to that. So if I get interested in something, I will just follow it. I've learned over the years that I, I have a pretty good intuition and I just have to follow it. And of course, it's difficult in between. You think, why am I traveling around the world, going to these places, making these images? What am I going to do with it? And I actually sit down. I have five large tables and prints are put out. Not are put out by someone. I put them out. And then I let them rest. And then I really try to see if the work will reveal itself to me. And that's how the museums were made. So it's not like I had photographed with the idea that I'll make a museum of machines or I'll make a museum of vitrines. It just so happened that in the work suddenly, in fact, museum of vitrines wasn't even made as a museum. Museum of vitrines was born during the show at the Hayward Gallery 
when I was installing Museum of Furniture and I said to Stephanie Rosenthal, wait, there's another museum here. And she said, no, 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 Dianita, we are opening in a few days. There's no question of adding another museum. I said, look, I'll take these five boxes. And there were exactly 15 vitrines, photographs of 15 vitrines. So if I had five boxes on the wall, I had another museum. So that became Museum of Vitrines. And so I was, I've been able to develop a structure that allows me to follow that intuitive sense that I follow when I make the work. That's a pretty good answer, no? Very good. Yeah. Thank you. It's a question right there. Thank you. So the next one? The lady in the printed. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk there, Anita. It's fascinating and I love your work and I'm one of your followers on Instagram. Um, what I really want you to... Uh, I mean, what I would like you to comment upon is your choice of the word museum. Because in a way, you have deconstructed the whole idea of a museum, you know, the way you display, the, your taxonomies, you're challenging the whole structure of a museum, right? Thank you. So, <laughs> but um, then in that context, then why this choice of the word of a museum, though you're challenging it? Precisely for that reason. If I had called it anti-museum or, you know, I. It's like, it took a long time. Nobody asked me that question in all these years. It's only now that it's in MoMA that now these questions are coming up. But till then, nobody even asked me, why are you calling it a museum? I called it a museum because to me, a museum, a physical museum, has, needs an architecture. It needs a way of showing its collection. It needs a reserve collection. It needs a catalog. It needs a cafe. It needs a gift shop. That's it. That's my idea of what a museum you know, absolutely. Yeah. And then someone told me it has to be open to the public. So I said, okay, every full moon, people can come to my house and look at the museums. <laughs> you know, don't have to say it has to be open every day. And then when I make this box, it's like a museum in your house. So it took, I'm so happy to hear your question because that's exactly what I was doing. But nobody, nobody discussed that with me. People just said, oh, nice photos, mm -hmm. clever structure. And it's quite disheartening, you know, because you know that you are... And, but I guess patience pays because then, you know, Glenn Lowry is talking about it on BBC uh, and he totally gets it. I never thought that of all the people, it would be a museum director who would understand my critique of the museum. Quite strong critique. Yeah, because, um, I mean, if I can continue. Of because I first saw your work at Bhaudajilat in Mumbai, and it's such a colonial museum, the whole structure, the whole display, the narrative is so colonial. And then your work stands totally in contrast to, you know, the whole setup. So I think that is what really made me think about your whole structure. About whom. Well, thank you so much for thinking like that. Really, truly, I'm, I mean it. It's maybe, other than Glenn Lowry, this is the first time someone <laughs> articulated it. Question up here. Thanks, Miranda. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> I really liked what you were saying about um, alternative histories of photography. Um, one thing I came across was this genre called The Hidden Mother, which is like an old genre where mothers would, would hide and hold their children really still because the exposure time was so long and they were hidden with cloths. And these photographs, if you look at them closely, you realize in the background there's a mother hidden by a cloth holding her child. And, and they point to these other histories of photography that aren't invoked. And I guess my question is, because this idea of the museum you have and the portable museum and different ideas of the museum, do you, do you ever think about the way that your museum could also kind of build this other canon or somehow include this other story? Um, not the way a historian might tell it, but through collecting up these images, a bit like this kind of idea of photography and artifice, which is like spirit photography or all these histories where photography was much more complicated from the beginning and much stranger. I would love to do that. I really would. I would start my history of photography actually with Anna Atkins mm. because I feel the boys showed us how to fix the image. But it was Anna Atkins who showed us what we could do with the image. And she made 13 versions of the book of the ferns of a part mm. of England, right? But 13 versions. She designed the font. She did the text herself. She sewed them herself. There were versions, they were not editions. She didn't sell them, she decided who to give them to. 
As an aside, I have a award in India for the best Indian male photographer. 50,000 rupees if you can establish to me how your gender determines how you see. So nobody has won the award as yet. <laughs> but certainly the idea of making my own history of photography museum. I've done it a little bit. Does someone have the Museum of Photography? Yeah, I have it. So you know there was that boom time for the Indian art world in 2000 or something, 2005, 2007. And I got very, very disturbed with all the India shows and how suddenly I had to put on, become this Indian photographer. And I thought, why am I being pigeonholed like this, you know? If it's a show about the influence of Satyajit Ray on photography, and then we're talking about photography from that region and I'm part of it, I get it. But to be clubbed together with Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, uh, and that photography from the region, it really made me angry. And so I went to one of the curators and I said, if you want to talk about photography in India, it's not really the photographers, but it's perhaps how we live with the image. And she didn't, she didn't pay attention to me because it would have meant many years of research. So I made this museum of photography for her actually. To, and I found these images of how we live with photographs. Mm -hmm. So to me, the Museum of Photography for India or the idea of the Indian photography is not in the photographers as much as it is in how we live with the images. When somebody, when a house is being pulled down, for example, the last thing to leave the house will be the images, the portraits. And you know, they're, you, they're displayed with the gods, with well, not the politicians now, but in earlier times with the politicians. Um, and who knows, maybe even now. So they have a very different place. So maybe that is the history of Indian photography and not a handful of photographers. So this, it's like a, it's a commercial model, no? That says Indian photographer, Brazilian photographer. Um, I... It's, it's, it's not required, and photography needs to move on in many ways. Um, I just, I think photography is really just raw material. It's just like collecting words. And then you have to think about what you're going to do with those words. You know, I'm, the museum is not a refrigerator that you can put all your word magnets onto. Mm -hmm. No, make a poem, make, make something out of that. Think of the form. So yes, it's possible that I could make my historic, my metropolitan museum of photography. Why not? <laughs> we have time Thank for you. one more question. Any last questions yeah. or comments? Are we good? Well, thank you, Danita. And you. Uh, of course, I have to make the plug again that the works are on display in my exhibition of South Asian photography <laughs> at the Ishara Art Foundation. <laughs> uh, but it's a thematic, not a representational show. <laughs> so thank you so much for being with us. It's been really special. And thank you to uh, Ishara Art Foundation and Al-Sarkal Avenue and Folio. Thank you. Thank you so much.